One of the things that, I, that um, I'm fond of saying is, um, is urgency should not enable desperation because desperation enables false solutions. And I think we're in a period in which the, the climate urgency framing and the climate emergency framing has um, opened up this, um, uh, this um, or has, cr has created new openings for all kinds of dangerous, deadly, distracting, and ultimately um, ineffectual kinds of approaches that in the end um, are sort of, in, um, you know, grasps at anything is better than nothing. And in reality, anything is better than nothing almost leads to nothing or worse. Um, and there is urgency. It isn't the question about whether there is or isn't urgency. The question is, the situation is so urgent that we have neither time, resources, energy, or political will that we can afford to waste on things that are speculative, that have the high potential to exacerbate the, um, the crisis, um, and that don't actually get at the root causes of the problem. Like we can't actually afford to waste any time. And, um, and we know actually what works, which is direct re uh, reduction of emissions at source by shutting down um, polluting industries and phasing out fossil fuels and implementing um, land reform and, so and, um, uh, and respecting sovereignty. And there, there are things that we know will work. Um, and I think actually emergency is, you know, emergency is always a double-edged sword, right? And the emergency allows you to suspend the normal rules, which can be really helpful. What I think is really interesting about the emergency moment we're in now with um, COVID-19 is the emergency moment um, has actually demanded that we subordinate the economy to the health and well-being of the people. Like we've decided that it is more important to save lives than it is to make money. And because of that, we've decided that we have to shut down the economy in order to deal with the preservation of life. We are subordinating economic activity to rights. And we can do it really quickly. And interestingly enough, it has a whole bunch of positive externalities associated with it including reduced greenhouse gas emissions, including reduced pollution. Um, uh, you know, this isn't to say that it doesn't have negative externalities associated with it also, but if we had planned to actually subordinate health and well-being to the economy, we would have planned and designed for that kind of a transition as opposed to being forced into it by a crisis. And I think every day that we don't actually make that plan for the transition, the, of climate, we end up perpetuating this very same phenomenon. Um, and, um, and we will ultimately have to do it. Like we will ultimately have to um, transform the economy to address the scale, pace, and implications of the crisis. And um, geoengineering, I think, is, you know, in addition to it just being um, a distraction from what we really need to do, most most, if not all, geoengineering is designed to, to continue to perpetuate business as usual around industry and economy. I think, I think it actually, people who, um, who, um, who come up with these, um, these fantastic notions of planetary scale manipulation or mirrors in space, or, um, or we're going to, um, we're going to, um, you know, take over all the land and build build fast growing trees that are going to suck all the carbon out of the atmosphere. All of these completely absurd notions are actually a profound reflection of a lack of imagination. Because you cannot imagine a world that does not look like the same political, economic, and social relationships we currently have. So you have to desperately imagine its preservation. And actually, those of us who can imagine different kind of social relations, can imagine greater connectivity, greater community, greater interactivity of people and community, those of us who can imagine being in relationship with the people who grow our food are actually liberated from our desperate attempt to hold on to the world as it looks and can actually imagine a whole other way of being. For us, the end of the fossil fuel regime is not this like, absurd impossibility. It's actually 
an imperative that we we can easily imagine living into because our uh, we have liberated ourselves from the constraint of our political imaginations to the world that currently exists. And I think that's something that I think is what's interesting about geoengineering. It's on, it's in, 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 on, uh, it, it is both at once like sci-fi and absurd, and, but, but more deeply reflects a profound lack of imagination. You cannot see yourself living in a world different than the world you live in, so you will do anything to preserve it. And I think that's a really in, the, the, the interesting parallel here. And I think we're, what we're seeing in the United States is this tension, this constant tension that exists in the, you know, in the, I don't know how else to say this, the dumbfuckery that is the American political system of unable to imagine a different way of being so much so that we're actually have a president in the United States and an entire administration that is actually weighing a pan, a, like preserving the status quo of the economy over losing potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. Like that's the level of like attachment they have to the status quo. And I think that's exactly the level of attachment that geoengineers have to the status quo. And so while it is presented as like, we must desperately act to deal with climate change, it is a profound ignorance of what is actually the cause of climate change, which gets to the other, like for me, the other big problem with the urgency framing, it doesn't actually name, and, and the emergency framing, it doesn't actually um, name um, what, the, what the actual cause of the emergency is, what, what the actual emergency is we're trying to deal with. It's like, it's sort of like, it and in fact perpetuates the notion that the symptoms are the emergency itself. And instead of, you know, it's, and exa it's, it's, it's no different than saying the emergency is the fever as opposed to the emergency is the, the virus that's causing the fever, the emergency is the disease. Um, and we're, we're in the same situation. It's like geoengineering is like, oh, the emergency is the fever. The emergency isn't the fever. The emergency is that we're not doing anything to stop the disease, right? That's the emergency. And to do that, you do have to change the way you live. Um, and and actually, quite honestly, for the better, <laughs> you know, you got to spend less time trapped in cars. You got to spend less time overpaying for cheap plastic crap, crap made by very small hands all over the planet. You know, like, yeah, there's some changes that are going to have to happen, but those changes are actually leaning into a better way of being. I think the other um, thing that I think, you know, um, that this emergency, the, the emergency moment that we're in with coronavirus can teach us about the emergency um, moment that we are in with climate change is, um, is that um, while we can understand a pandemic, pandemic literally simply means all people, pan, all, demic, demos, people. A pandemic just means it's something that affects all people. It doesn't actually even come from medicine. Um, crisis, on the other hand, actually does come from medicine. So we should be really calling it the climate pandemic and the, um, and, uh, and the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis. But that notwithstanding, um, even though we can understand a pandemic um, as a planetary scale disruption in the same way that we can understand climate um, disruption as planetary scale, what we are learning and what is also true about climate is the strategic point of intervention for dealing with it is going to be on the ground, in your community, coordinated across place with mutual solidarity. There isn't going to be a planetary scale intervention that is going to, at the scale, pace, and um, intensity required, address the pandemic nor is there going to be a planetary scale intervention that at the scale, pace, and intensity required address uh, climate destabilization. It just can't. It's too energy intensive, it takes too much time, it takes too much resources, all of which could be spent transitioning from, um, from, uh, uh, from a, a corporate controlled fossil fuel regime to energy democracy. That, could be um, a transition from industrial agriculture that um, leads to deforestation, um, erosion of, of habitats and, and um, 
and ecosystems that results in the higher likelihood of um, of, uh, of viruses jumping from 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 um, from exotic and wild um, species into um, into human um, human agroecosystems and um, industrial food systems, like to food sovereignty to um, to peasant and subsistence agriculture. Like we know what it takes, and every minute that we spend imagining that we're going to reproduce a planetary volcanic eruption in order to bounce some of the Earth's radiation back into space for the next hundred plus years with jet planes, we are not spending actually figuring out and driving towards what it takes to actually address the crisis.